Good morning, beautiful people. Welcome to Kiko's Free Thinkers Forum. I welcome a very special guest with me this morning. Garrett Ball is a professor of communication studies at Morgan State University in Baltimore, Maryland, and founder of imixwhatilike.org and a co-founder of Black Power Media. They're both independent Black media outlets that challenge the status quo and the material conditions of Black people. He's the author of the myth and propaganda of Black buying power, a book that we're gonna talk a little bit about today. He earned his PhD in journalism and mass communication at the University of Maryland. Um, you're currently at Morgan State right now, correct? Yes. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the HBCU dynamic. We have um, a couple of topics that we're really gonna hit on today, but um, we're just gonna get it started. Welcome to the show. I appreciate you accept accepting the invite. No, it's a pleasure. I appreciate the invitation. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I've followed you from afar for a while, a couple of years now. And um, it, I always get educated from Black Power Media. I mix what I like. And I think it's an outlet that still, I'm surprised that it's not as popular as it should be. But you've alluded to that in a couple of interviews that I've listened to about how um, the impact of your work how it hasn't gotten this mass sort of um, reception from the people. Um, can you kind of speak a little bit to that? Like, as far as the reasons why you think that is? Sure. Uh, well, the short of it is, is that, uh, you know, contrary to the way it's often promoted to be, the media environment we have is, is one that is in many ways carefully organized to suppress dissident communication or dissident forms of communication. Um, so uh, whether it's algorithmic uh, influence or advertising influence or the influence of uh, previously developed worldviews, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the kinds of uh, perspectives and information that we focus on are, are less likely to draw that much attention. Uh, so in some ways, you know, we always would like to have more of an impact, but in, in many ways, I, I'm often surprised to the extent we have any audience at all, um, despite, again, the appearance of an ability for any, and, you know, of course, anybody can start some sort of platform, uh, but to reach an audience uh, or a sizable audience uh, is still um, often very difficult if you, again, don't conform to a certain pre-set uh, and pre-encouraged, uh, uh, you know, pattern of of thinking. I I totally see that perspective, and um, I think when I decided to start my forum a few months ago, a couple of people said that I was going to have issues just with my title alone, you know, when they see free thinker in the title, and then I'm a black person on top of it, but a lot of people don't see me as black necessarily just based on Kiko, that kind of confuses them, it's more ambiguous, but when they see the face, they're like, okay, what is this about? And so this is very much an anti-establishment forum. We advocate, we're not really into electoral politics, but when we do promote electoral politics, it's only third party. We don't mess with the duopoly stuff at all. Mm. And so I think you're automatically put in a box once you decide to go against the corporate narratives. Well, that's that's you know usually how I oversimplify the the narrowing of the media landscape that it you know the the encouraged media landscape, and that is if. if uh, do, do you, does your analysis lead to conclusions outside the Democrat or Republican Party? Oh, yeah. um, you know, that it, that's a pretty good way, because even to, for, for to a certain extent among uh, a more popular white right wing that feels outside or exists outside of that duopoly, uh, uh, even as popular and as as much of an audience that they actually have uh they are not uh, uh pop cultural they are not mainstream uh which again is part of 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 uh you know demonstrates what the what the mainstream attempts to do it's not you know again you know well not necessarily again in this conversation but the main what is mainstream or popular is not necessarily uh even what is 
uh, uh, most sizable an audience. Um, uh, it's 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 what is created to be the norm, mm -hmm. you know, so that anybody, even if you have a, a much larger audience than per se we do, uh, if you're outside that duopoly, you're not going to be in the mainstream. I mean, for instance, I mean, even even the the I mean. Uh, and this is not to say he's <laughs> valuable or supportable uh, and, or worthy of support, but but you know, for instance, Alex Jones has a much larger audience oh, yeah. than anybody on mainstream television, mm -hmm. but he's not included or considered welcomed in the mainstream. It's not even mm -hmm. to say that the owners of the mainstream don't agree with him. It's just that his version of what they try to do is not acceptable and he plays mm -hmm. a, a different political role but 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 anyway but my point just simply is that that you can have a huge audience and still not be popular in in the sense of of uh um you, you know a, a a political sense of what is pop cultural or or mainstream i hope that i think sense. that's an excellent way to explain it basically to the audience, there's levels to a lot of this stuff. So it, like you said, it's very easy to sort of put things in boxes and parameters, but um, there's a lot um, of, of, when you delve into what mainstream is, it's not exactly um, a consistent definition. But like you said, even those people, and I'm not gonna drop a bunch of names, but some people have two, three million subscribers on YouTube, they wouldn't be considered mainstream, but right. they have such a niche audience that um they also have traction but it's not quite acceptable i guess for the the mainstream media taste um i kind of want to know um how did you start as far as your political development i like to ask my guests that um where is your journey have you always been sort of against the grain when it came to the way you thought about the political world yeah i mean i have a a, a you know a relatively um uh, uncommon upbringing uh, that that involved a lot of radical politics and left ideas. So uh, um, and was itself organized in an unconventional way. So I mean, so yeah, I mean, in many ways, I was predisposed. And I think you know, as I've said before elsewhere, that that where I've ended up politically is logical. I mean, it's it it makes sense. Um, so uh um so yeah i mean but uh um uh um so yeah i mean with that unconventional origin uh, you know i i you know um uh sort of follow that same trajectory into activism and academia uh so I don't know how much I don't know how much detail or time we want to take with that, but 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 that's the shortest answer I could give for that. No, that's fine. I was just um because I spoke with Margaret Kimberly and it it seems to kind of be that a lot of black people are, are molded into this democratic party sort of leaning. Mm -hmm. And then over time they kind of rediscover themselves and become um they transform into more radical people, um, sort of breaking away from those old ways of thinking that's why i kind of um i was curious as far as like how you were brought up in that regards but i know a lot of that well i mean i was you know like i you know specifically i was you know um you know raised by you know my mother who is a a, 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 a russian descended jew and uh, coming out of new york uh with with strong anti-zionist and communist politics and labor his organizing histories and and surveillance going back to her mother uh uh you know by the state um and then she married uh my black father coming out of the the black power civil rights and black power struggle himself uh, and though he was not involved directly in my raising, a lot of the positive mythology around the work he was doing was directly a component of of my upbringing. So, you know, um, I've just it, just in terms of what was around iconography, icon iconographically or symbolically or whatever in my household was just always um, 
references, to, you know, was not just references, but but books of, uh, you know, Malcolm and Fanon and Che and the Panthers and, um, you, you know, Marx and Lenin and, you know, Stalin. And I mean, I mean, these were just, you know, uh, not that it was, you know, um, overly imposed. They were just around the books, the, 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 the pictures, the posters, the references, the discussion, uh, the criticism. Um, you know, so, uh, um, anyway, so yeah, I, I mean, it was, it was just, you know, uh, add to that a healthy dose, a dose of sort of aggressive atheism. And, uh, you know, I mean, it was just a very unconventional, you know, and then a uh, very working class, um, um, you know, what I call suburban section eight, you know, we did grow, I did grow up in, in, in the suburbs, but in literally the, the, the quote unquote low income section eight subsidized housing part. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it was all these different, you know, unconventional, you know, uh, and then like many, as a young man, I just started reading Malcolm X and actually paying attention to what I was, you know, and, and, and that was that. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's really, you know, I mean, it was, and usually how I just, and I'll just wrap it here by saying, you know, the, 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 the questions I was always encouraged to ask about the world led me to the conclusions and the analysis that, that, that I've adopted and that others have laid down because they were asked similar questions, uh, or kept asking similar questions, mm -hmm. uh, that that can only be answered with certain analyses with certain with certain interpretations of the world so and when do you grow up again i was born in washington dc and i okay. grew up uh in uh in in the very planned suburban neighborhood or city of columbia maryland um which i think itself is a very microcosmic interesting example or demonstration of how the society works where you, where, you know, like where I grew up was the almost exclusively black and poor and gentrified, like all, like my initial neighborhood was everybody who was gentrified out of Baltimore, DC mm -hmm. and put in this small section eight community of apartments and, and townhouses and uh, grew up in, you know, surrounded by extending circles of, of, wealth mm -hmm. uh and with the idea that this was going to create some utopia this race and class utopia <laughs> but that doesn't of course work uh without massive change to to uh the economy to to the politics to uh the culture of society and, and none of that occurs when you just put pockets of poor black people in in the suburbs. A hundred percent. I totally agree. I um I wanted to go back to your background um in Morgan State University where you're currently at right now. And um the reason why I brought you on, not only because of your book, The Myth of Propaganda of Black Byron Power, but also I just graduated from UT Knoxville with a PhD in Latin American literature, Caribbean literature. And so I studied Congratulations. a lot. I appreciate it. And we studied the Fanons and the Césaires and some of the um, Afro-diasporic um, thinkers of our times. And, um, but I've always been in the PWI atmosphere. And I talked to Jay Clark um, a couple of episodes ago, and he's, I would describe him as a young Black millennial. We have a lot of different views about the whole capitalistic system. And that's another reason why I brought you on, because what you're saying in your book is almost opposite of what he was suggesting. Um, in his interview, which was more optimistic towards um, be, basically people going to get theirs, you know, getting your money. And, and so it's a really interesting dynamic talking to you because it's, it's people can see different sides of the, of the coin. Um, as far as the HBCU experience is concerned, do you feel like you can teach whatever you want to teach there? Because I'm not going to drop names again, but there are professionals that I'm associated with that tell me the Kiko, if you pursue employment in the HBCU, you may not have certain funding opportunities, but 
I'm looking beyond the funding. I want to be who I am as a person with my leftist politics and views that aren't in line with the establishment in academia. So how would you feel as far as that's concerned? Do you feel like you can teach what you want, be who you are in that environment? So let me just preface what I'm about to say by saying, one, I want to invite you or anyone else who, um, um, well, I don't, actually, I'm not sure if you would, would qualify for this, but anyone who has had any HBCU experience as a faculty, student, admin, staff, uh, um, uh, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A uh, parent, uh, any experience to go to I mix what I like.org, which is my website. Mm -hmm. And uh, right there on the front page, they'll see featured uh, the my not a different world HBCU project. And I'm inviting people to contribute their experiences to this longitudinal study. I'm, I'm at least calling it for now uh, that will eventually produce, I don't know, maybe several things. Mm -hmm. uh, but but I admit that it's also meant primarily to be a vehicle for me to, to share sort of uh, my own experiences uh, with almost 20 years as faculty at an HBCU. Um, uh, and what the title suggests is that it's not a different world in the sense that if anybody remembers or grew up on or has watches reruns of a different world, mm -hmm. That show had a had a uh, had a lot to do with uh, certain generations of people wanting to go to HBCUs of them having a resurgence of popularity, but they project. I think, in my argument, is in my experience, they project a very mythologized version of what the HBCU is and is here to do. Uh, so I don't want this project to be just my criticism. I want to, I do want to include a balance of other people's experiences, good and bad, so mm -hmm. that it's just not a straight, you know, Jared complaint piece, but, <laughs> but that is ultimately, you know, so, so I say all that to say that I am biased and I want to be clear about that bias as, you know, uh, uh, in this answer, but um, uh, what my experience has shown is that uh, with some now, I think, academic data to support it is, is that uh, uh, you cannot be the, the left free thinking radical and expect a welcomed, pleasant experience or even a prolonged experience at an HBCU. They're not there to, 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 to foment free thinking black radicalism. Oh, wow. Uh, they are very much about creating, just as they have always been historically, about producing a particular kind of Black citizen. Most of that in involves a healthy dose of Black capitalism, mm -hmm. of national state, that is the, 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 the U.S. broader state project support, uh, that is from military aggression to to uh, surveillance to uh, you know I mean one of my favorite examples I mean people I mean many who have are not are not aware that just for instance one small relatively seemingly small thing when Morgan State almost a decade ago now I think at least uh, switched over its email to to Google to Gmail. Mm -hmm. And some might think that's a small thing or a cool thing, but what does that do? That gives all of our faculty and student email and well, well um, uh, data that is mm -hmm. digital data over to Google. That's why they do that. So mm -hmm. every email you write, even emails you type and don't send produce data that is retrievable by Google for sale and resale to whomever and whatever uh, to for whatever. So, so in other words, the university, under the guise of being a, 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 a bastion of blackness, did what any other university does. It handed its student body over to the data collectors so that it can make a little bit of money. Um, so, I mean, that's just one example, just one mm -hmm. very simple base example. There are an endless amount of others that, that ultimately, and I'll, I'll just wrap here, 
produce an experience that I've shared for a while now that uh, is summarized in a response I got to uh, uh, after a, 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 a a private discussion with a, a former high-ranking administrator of the of of a HB of of of, of, <laughs> of, of Morgan State no of Morgan State University uh, some years ago uh, and we had a multi uh, you know a multiple hour conversation where I was laying out what I saw happening and at the end of the discussion this person says to me quote Doctor Ball your problem is you want to create new knowledge <clears throat> and we don't do that here. Mm. your job is to create menial laborers for the communications industry, end quote. That is a verbatim quote that I have been, I have remembered and, and you know, reflecting on for a long time. And, and I think it perfectly captures what mine and many others, exper others experience has been, um, uh, so it's not that everything there is bad. It's just that it's not the, it's not a different world. It's not the mm -hmm. difference of experience that people think that they're going to get uh, or hope that they're going to get when they go to an HBCU. And um, so, yeah. I guess that would make sense because I've made the argument on this pod for a while that um, that the university is basically, it's the, it's the way you look at the two-party system is no different than that sort of establishment. I mean, it's just an academic establishment at the end well, of the I day. I mean, we have to be fair, like, you, you know, like to be fair. And this is, so, I mean, I'm not even just, you know, uh, again, I've had in many cases, in many ways, a particularly bad experience uh, for a good portion of the time that I've been there. Mm. But, but to be fair, um, the people who rise to prominence and su sustain themselves at these institutions, they're not there to, they're not coming from the politics and the struggle that I feel like has produced me. They're not there, the institution is not there to produce the people I want. They're not there to produce Jared's comrades. Mm -hmm. They're there to produce, again, a particular form of black American citizen. Um, so, I, you know, I, even when I, it, when I can step back objectively and look at my own experience, I can't, I can't blame them. I mean, it's in many ways what I would expect, uh, 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 to have happen. It's, 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 it is the experience my analysis would predict. It's, it's just difficult to actually go through it. It's the difference between mm -hmm. theory and practice, yeah. uh, but it's not inconsistent. And I, at, you know, and at certain points, I can maybe even in this conversation temporarily step back and look at even the individuals who I've thought behaved with wild lack of principle and decency and say, look, I mean, I get it. I mean, they were, they were encouraged to that behavior by the institution itself. Uh, and that is ultimately how I think we have to develop our analysis and, and not, you know, whether as I do when I'm talking about being critical, for instance, of a celebrity or an artist or another academic, uh, um, it, it's not personal. It, it is to, to, to look at the process that produced them. So even as we ultimately talk about buying power, it's, it's the, the end result of a process so again, and then I'll stop here. It is what Malcolm used to say, Malcolm X used to say about, we can't be shocked about a chicken laying a chicken egg. You know what I mean? If a chicken lays a <laughs> duck egg, he said that would be one revolutionary chicken. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not, it's, it's, it's going to produce a chicken. Yeah. It's not going to produce a duck. And I'm over here wanting to be a duck coming yeah. out of a chicken. It's not going to happen is the point. So anyway, you know. That's actually really eye-opening to me, though, Jared, just you explaining that as far as um, how really the infrastructure itself is not that much different than the PWIs. Because I, I, I honestly, that's why I asked you the question, because I went in with a completely um, more innocent approach. I really thought that there was some sort of an internal difference when it came to, like, especially from the political avenue. But um, what you're saying doesn't suggest that at all. 
I mean, my salary at a public institution is, a, is public record. People can look it up, including all the way up to the president. Where else are people going to make this kind of money? That's true. The president of Howard, I think, is now making like over like a million and change, mm -hmm. million and five, million five. Like where else are you going to make that kind of money? And what do you expect? And relative, relative to wealth, those are pennies. But relative to Black people and Black income, that is a, a, a rarity that's beyond the, that's beyond, uh, 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 the likelihood of winning a lottery. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how close my numbers, I mean, I'm saying that to be hyperbolic <laughs> a little bit, but I wonder how close I am to that. I bet I'm pretty close. I bet, I bet you're more likely to win a Powerball than, than you are to be Black making a million and a half dollars a year. Mm-hmm. And I'm happy to be checked. If anybody sees this, email me or put it in the chat. They run the numbers on that. But I'm serious. I mean, you know, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so so if if you're if I'm making a million and a half dollars, am I likely to tolerate a bunch of Jareds running around teaching what they would want to teach and how they would want to teach? I don't know about that. And if I'm funding the person making that kind of money, is that what I'm funding you to do? If 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 a whole bunch of people are, are leaving Morgan with these degrees and are leading revolutionary movements, I think a lot of the funding base is going to start saying, you know, which includes the state. You mm -hmm. know, Howard is a private institution, but it's heavily funded by the state. Mm -hmm. uh, black graduates aren't earning enough money, even black graduates of Howard don't make enough money to kick back enough money to keep a president making a million and a half a year. But so they're getting, I mean, they, so they get, there's all this state money. That's my point. It's, these are state institutions, small mm -hmm. state and big state. So what, what would, what, what would we expect? That's true. Yeah, I, I get and then, that. And then never mind that there is a particular history of HBCUs and there are people who, you know, you know, uh, um, you know, my good brother, Dr. Jelani Favors has written a, a great book on the history uh, and, and he and I agree a, a lot and, and, and have some disagreement with, with, with some other, uh, in terms of uh, our interpretation of some other histories related to HBCUs. So there is, there is a discussion and, and the, uh, you know, some disagreement, but so, you know, uh, uh, that said, my understanding and my interpretation is that these, these institutions were created by whites to create uh, and, and were largely led by whites uh, and they're largely named for whites and their white funders. Uh, Morgan State is not named after a black man. Howard University is not named after mm -hmm. a black man. Hampton University is not named after a black man. And on we go. Mm -hmm. uh, um, because they were put, they were created particularly largely after the so-called civil war to create a get to 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 as Donald Spivey once wrote, the schoolhouse was meant to replace the stability lost with the demise of the plantation. Mm, yeah. So so they were they were there to create a light skinned, buffered elite, and if it's not based on complexion, it was certainly based on class mm -hmm. to create this class of black folks who would be the first to raise a voice in defense of the country when other than when the majority of the black population might continue to raise questions about <laughs> their treatment mm -hmm. they can always parade the handful of graduates and faculty uh and say hey don't get that upset so i mean and and versions of that go on to this day i mean that's that's what they're here to do that's so mm -hmm. if you come in there, 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 there is, there is the, there are business schools at HBCUs. There are not schools of, of, you know, there's no Marxist education. There's no Marxist institution at an HBCU. There's no pan-Africanist, not beyond a label that is, there's no, you know, based in, in radical pan-Africanism and scientific socialism and African United States of Africa, Kwame Nkrumah, Tereus, 
you know, Sekou mm-hmm. Tereus politics. There's no institutions around those politics. No. <laughs> when Du Bois is brought up on HBCUs, it's almost never to discuss his socialism and his Pan-Africanism. So, so. 100%. Uh, uh, I mean, no, you, you know. No, this is, this, this honestly, this is very enlightening information. Now, and one more know, thing. I'm sorry. One more thing. No, no, I'm sorry. One more thing. Going, keep going, keep going. Let me know the next time you see a commercial or any popular reference to an HBCU that is not focused on step shows and marching bands. <laughs> Can't, hard to disagree with you. You know, yeah. You're totally and with all correct. due respect to my work and the handful of others, let me know when the next time you, you read or see a heavily promoted popular magnum opus monster publication of a book that comes from an academic at an HBCU. And it's not because we're stupid or less qualified. The, mo- the biggest reason is we don't get funding and we're teaching four classes a semester. Mm-hmm. And if your teacher, if your faculty member, even a full professor with tenure and, and 18, I think this is my 18th year just at Morgan or 17th year just at Morgan, if I'm still teaching four classes every semester, it, just, just having a faculty member that, and anyone who's a student, ask your favorite faculty members, how many classes are they teaching every semester? And if they're saying three and four, your, 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 your institution, not your faculty member, your institution is, discouraging the best form of education, the mm-hmm. best form of experience with that faculty member. You cannot do your best work teaching four classes a semester, every semester You're totally for right. every year and getting half the salary and being told that your university-wide budget for going to conferences is $5,000. Mm. University-wide. So you can't go to conferences, you can't do, you can't get, it's not that you can't, you're less, because there are many people doing great work is my point, Mm -hmm. but you're doing it in spite of getting less and less and having to do more and more and more, where if you go to a PWI, most of the faculty members, most people know of are teaching one or two classes at most. Mm -hmm. They have teaching assistants, graduate assistants. They have small class sizes. If they have big class sizes, they're not doing the grading. They're not doing the, they're they're walking in, giving a lecture and they're walking out. They're not teaching four classes. They're not advising students. They're not, you know, chasing down their own grant money. They're not, you you know, (laughs) it's just not, they're not doing all of that. Uh, um, And that's why they're able to produce in some cases, at least some really, really, really great work. Mm Many people abuse that situation and produce garbage and just just so they can get on TV. But, you know, the the point still remains. If your institution is saying all of your faculty are teaching four classes a semester, they're 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 saying that the classroom experience is not meant to be the highest quality experience you could have. And your your faculty are not meant to produce at the best rate with the best work that they can produce. So then the question becomes, what is the institution there to do? Mm-hmm. I, I was, I appreciate this um, in-depth explanation of things because I have an audience that is not necessarily black majority. I, I'd say mm-hmm. a third or or forty percent of my audience is black, but I have quite a diverse audience um, from different countries. We have a lot of people from Latin America, Europe, Asia, Africa. So it's not just a one type of um, audience that I have in different social classes. So I appreciate the explanations across the board because a lot of people will benefit um, from that just to get into the HBCU experience more because I think people really just need the general base education when it comes to these affairs. I Uh wanted to transition into the myth and propaganda of Black Byron Power. I was reading or watching this movie and you mentioned it several times in your book, The Secret of Selling the Negro, which <laughs> I think was produced in 1954, which is, yeah. I, when I was reading like the, a little bit of the book, I was like, yeah, I know I saw this somewhere before about basically the marketing schemes that they used to get black people to sort of incorporate themselves into 
society after the world war and people really viewing this as a positive i looked at their site i think it's called real black is the youtube channel and the comment section is so baffling to me you have half of the people that are like oh look how positive this is you know they actually treating people very civilized in the video and then you have the other half saying they're just treating them like consumers basically just disposable and so that's kind of what your book goes into the whole um idea of not even necessarily black people i kind of read it from two different ways i read it as yep yeah, it's a formation of a black capitalist class that basically is spending money giving them a false sense of empowerment when it's just making them more of a consumer driven just part of this society this capitalistic um endeavor to begin with and then i read it from like it could really apply to anybody regardless of their social class or their race and just it highlights the 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 deficiencies of capitalism basically um what would you respond to that so uh i mean the short of it is is that you know what i'm ultimately arguing arguing in that book is that that what is popularly promoted uh, over and over and all the time as this buying power that black people have is really just a rebranding of um, a black capitalist ethic that was created and imposed ever again, similar to what I'm saying about HBCUs is another mechanism to discourage black people from achieving political power uh, uh, and and having some sort of revolutionary impact on society. So uh, black capitalism, uh, much like it's just a subset of capitalism, which is propagandized in much the same way, but with a specific version that targets black audiences tailored to the history and experiences of black people. So, the, you know, and it's often confused by the 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 black progenitors of uh, or at least the black distributors of the the, the mythology. Uh, who have their own interests for doing it. So John H. Johnson, when he does the um, selling of the Negro video, he's doing it because like other black capitalist media owners of the day, he wanted to capture white advertising revenue, which is what all commercial media needs. Uh, so to do that, he needed, he worked um, in, a, in a very uh, grossly symbiotic way with with the federal government, with corporate America, uh, who had their own interests for promoting this mythology, uh, to 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 say, look, black people earn fifteen billion dollars a year. Uh, at the time, that's what the number was. Uh, so that number is what what is the buying power of the community. Look at how strong that they are, and as the video showed, they just want to be good American, you know, middle class citizens. They pay their bills on time. They they shop. Uh, they're not, you know, and the, the 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 implicit message was they're not out there, you know, marching and protesting, and they're not, you know, they're not trying to be a, a, a problem. Uh, so, if you want to capture that fifteen billion dollars as a as a as a corporate seller of goods, advertise with us, and mm -hmm. and you know, because he knew. I mean, the, the 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 paradox, of course, is that black media owners know. Like today, Roland Martin knows that his black audience doesn't make enough money to make him the kind of money he wants. Mm. So he takes on white advertising and promotes himself to them as a conduit of black buying power to their to 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 white advertisers. Mm -hmm. So again, it's not it's not to hate on him. It's just it's not even to be critical of him. It just explains why we get a version of an analysis from his from his media. From from the Johnsons of the world historically that we get, and that 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 media is what I think I didn't I didn't admittedly hear it or see it, but but how you describe it, that is what produces the analysis of your the previous guest you said the, uh, that you had recently promoting black capitalism or the uh -huh. the hopefulness in this economy, that that is the that is the constructed result, an intended result, a consciously created result of a of a decades long process of promoting to black audiences through black media this idea that there's nothing wrong with capitalism you just have to have more financial literacy and you can do well 
Uh, and that was the micro, that was the, the subset of the, the mythology promoted and that it still is after the second world war out to the world by the United States who wanted to say, now that we've won this war, if you follow our version of, of business and economy and capitalism and mythology and myth, mythologically, myth, yeah, myth, myth, mythologically as, associate capitalism with democracy and freedom mm -hmm. uh you in your country will be able to thrive just like we do here and look at even our formerly enslaved africans do well when they adopt these practices so anywhere in the world there there you you can replicate this this and get the desired result um so that's that's anyway that's that's what i'm trying to explain in the work and and trying to demonstrate through the the by showing the origins of the myth, how it's recycled, how it's empty, how there's no data or science to support it. Uh, 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 and, and what the data always show is that Black people don't have any money, Black people are intentionally kept out of the economy, that even when the economy does well, so-called, Black people are in what the Economic Policy Institute calls a permanent recession. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there is no moment where Black people can come up. Uh, and And yet, the mythology is just recycled with such almost beauty. Oh, it's absolutely, point. it's absolutely absurd. I mean, that statistic yeah. you had, I think was within the first 15 pages, something about a trillion dollars or something, which is a completely, basically, you were basically making the point that a, each black person was like a millionaire, it still wouldn't even add up to the figure that they were coming Well, no, what I, was, what I was really trying to show is that, it, 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 and, and I should probably rework that for the second edition that's coming out next year, but, but oh, just to clarify. No, no, thanks. But, 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 but I, I, there are a couple of things I'd like to clean up, and one of them might be this, that, that really what I'm saying is that by their faulty estimates, really what they're saying is that if every Black person, man, woman, child, infant, elderly, you know, like every human being, right. whether you're working or not, whether you're old enough to work or not, if every single one of those people uh, um, took, uh, was earning $40,000 a year, roughly, which is about the, 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 the national average, that every penny they earned would total the roughly one point now, I think five or $6 trillion that they're saying is the, the collective black buying power. Um, and what they're really saying is, if you give us every penny you earn, that equates to having power. And then it's falsely reported as an economic strength that could be invested better, that could be saved better, and all this other stuff, none of which is true, because mm -hmm. that's not what buying power is a measurement of. So when you look at real data about income and wealth, the it's it's very clear by 2053 black wealth is said to be headed to zero mm -hmm. so what in the hell are people doing and in fact one of my favorite moments and i do want to add this in the second edition if you if anybody watches this this earn your leisure group which are wildly popular black podcasters who oh, gosh. wildly recklessly about the economy i mean almost everything that they say is wrong when it comes <laughs> to the economy but they they had this moment where they're interviewing this brother from CNBC or MSNB, one of these NBCs, and they, and, and it was about a report that came out earlier this year, and it, and and they were confused because it said black buying power is going up, but black wealth is going down, and they were saying with without irony, like they were legit confused. How can our <laughs> how how does this work? How do we have more power and less wealth? because buying power is not a measurement of wealth. Exactly. It's not a measurement of income. It's not a measurement of anything other than your ability. It's, it's only an estimate of your ability to buy other people's products so they can determine how to, 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 to spend their ad revenue. That's mm -hmm. all that is. It gets reported to Black people by other Black people who are using this mythology to get ad revenue for their own selves Mm -hmm. as actual strength and then they start throwing in references to garvey and du bois and whoever else <laughs> and start saying if we were like them 
Now, lastly on this, the problem is I talk a little bit about in the book is that both Garvey and Du Bois and Malcolm and mm-hmm. others, as great as they were in many ways, they, they misunderstood this mythology going back to their time as well. So there's a long history of misunderstanding this mythology that predates Johnson. Johnson was just like the uptick mm-hmm. of, of the, 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 new, the new version. Uh, um, but there's been a long misunderstanding about this that, that um, on the one hand, I'm happy to say I'm the only one to, to call out and, and, and expose as false, but, but as a result, I'm also easily ignored and marginalized. So, mm. so when did you, it when did you, it, honestly, when I read your book, it made me think of, I don't want to be too pessimistic, but even stuff like, you know, when I was growing up watching Soul Train, it's like this stuff, I guess, psychologically, we need some like some sort of, even if it's commercial art, you know, like it makes people feel a certain way. People have nostalgia, emotions towards it. But even those sort of productions like Soul Train and any of the black sitcom shows back in the day, they were all they would all fall within this whole idea of what you're talking about is the commercialization of images. And they were all promoted specifically at a time in the post black power era to suppress further rebellion. I mean, it's not that these shows weren't great. I grew up watching all of them, but Mm -hmm. the reality is they existed to discourage people from reaching the conclusions you have to reach if you want to have a revolution. So I don't know what to do other than to say, if we want to have something that collectively takes care of everybody, then we can't be following these myths and we have to do something else. Um, There is no entrepreneurial path to collective improvement. Uh, And the favorite statistic that was not in the first edition that will go in the second edition, because I was a a part of a, a, a research paper a small part of a research paper that 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 produced uh, or or highlighted this stat, but from two thousand from nineteen ninety two to two thousand and twelve, black people produced created more than two million businesses, and the percentage of the capture of national revenue spent on businesses in this country went down from a mere one percent to point zero three percent. So the point is, you can make all the businesses you want. Black people are as entrepreneurial as any other group of people ever. Mm-hmm. But that's not how, how wealth for a community is created. And uh, uh, that won't work for Black people. And then, by the way, lastly, just very simply, even in a white supremacist capitalist country, m- most white people aren't even rich or even doing that well. <laughs> Totally. So that should be yet another sign that this isn't going to work for, for us, you know, mm-hmm. like even with the advantage of not being enslaved and not being Jim Crowed and all of that, white people aren't mm-hmm. equal. And again, the biggest critic of capitalism in Karl Marx was a white guy talking about exclusively white people. He, mm-hmm. he almost never focused on uh, 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 black people or colonialism or, or any, I mean, he did a little bit here and there, but that wasn't to my knowledge, I'm not an expert, but from, you know, that wasn't his focus. The point being a white dude in, in a white Europe saw that white capitalism <laughs> doesn't work for white people. So that's what his point was. He wasn't, he, he wasn't writing, a, a, he wasn't, he doesn't, he didn't write the communist manifesto with angles f- to help black people. <laughs> no. It does help black people. I, I mean, I think his work does help black people, but that's not what his point was. His point was white folks that like that was his immediate. He's like everywhere I go and all the countries in Europe I get kicked out of. I get kicked out of them or imprisoned in them because I'm noticing and reporting on the discrepancy between we're in, we're an empire, we're, in, we're conquering the whole planet and yet producing more inequality here. Yeah. <laughs> so so it's like so now after all of that, we're supposed to come down at the end of all of that and say we're going to catch up to white folks by starting businesses. <laughs> and, and 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 honestly, before before we conclude, actually, 
I'm a big proponent of reparations. I don't know if you are mm-hmm. or not. Um, but see, the thing that bothers me the most about the reparations discussion, we, we actually talked about it with um, Jay Clark a few episodes ago, and he agrees with reparations himself, but he's more of the mindset. He's almost giving up on it, like realistically, will it ever happen? And I'm more optimistic about it, but the issue is that if reparations does become a part of um, our reality, would the same people use reparations to sort of redirect redirect into this whole myth of buying power? Like, how would they even distribute it? You know, it, even if people did decide to come on board with reparations, would they so it's not that I'm. It's not that I'm opposed to reparative justice. It's that I'm opposed to the mythologies associated with the reparations movement. I'm a, I'm 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 not a fan of uh, uh, people's almost exclusive political work in some cases being trying to oh. convince this country to give reparations. Um, if for you know, because if we have a revolution, if we have political power, then the the issue of reparations is moot. You just re- right. you are in control. You just redistribute the resources that you need. So so you know I you know I admittedly come out of uh, 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 you know a, a wing of the movement so to speak where reparations was never really a focus. The re- reparations was not a focus of Malcolm of Martin of the Panthers of the Black Liberation Army of George Jackson of Asada Shakur of you know th- this was not there of Sophia Bakari, of, of mm-hmm. you know, internationally of, of Walter Rock. I mean, like, like uh, Fanon wasn't talking about reparations no, was. for Algerians from the French. No, he was talking about a revolution where the French are destroyed and their ability mm-hmm. to colonize anyone is wrapped up. So like that's, so, so yeah, so, so am I for a process where on, uh, you know, where there's maybe a stage where resources are redistributed with intention to people who are enslaved, who are, are descendants of the enslaved? Absolutely. I mean, it makes perfect sense. Um, do I think it's likely? Do I think we're headed in the right direction for that? No. Do I think the associated politics are, are, are appropriate? No. Uh, philosophically, I think we're then asking for our fair share of the exploitation of our ancestors and of the rest of the planet um you know because ultimately what produces the pool of wealth that this country would have to redistribute to us comes from our ancestors and a, a centuries and current exploitation of much of the planet mm-hmm. when do we address that part of the process i'm not sure that many people advocating for reparations you know uh, and then, by the way, the reparations movement today is being used to create disunity among the African diaspora, among uh, d- different elements and segments of the African world that exist in this country and, and, and elsewhere. So there's a lot of problems I have with with what's happening with with reparations uh, that have nothing to do with my obvious support for resources being redistributed in a way that addresses the the continued inequality that black people particularly suffer, which is why all, all of my work starts with an, a, a particular emphasis and focus on black people here in the United States. But to get to an international revolution, that's my goal. I'm not trying to make that focus uh, permanent and, and exclusive and exhaustive. So that's, that's where I think I, I dis- disagree with, with, with some in that, in that, in that, in that struggle. Um, uh, Anyway, I don't know if I fully answered your question or, no, you or did. all of it, but I, yeah. ju- I just I just needed one clarification, and then sure. I'll let you go because I know I got places to go. I know you do too. I really appreciate you doing this with me. Um, regardless, uh, the one part you talked about splitting sort of the Afro diasporic elements is that mm-hmm. a criticism towards the ADOS movement? Oh yeah, I don't. I'm yeah. I'm in total. Di- I'm in fact right. I'm the exact inverse. I I like my man, you know my 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 comrade created the the he he he, and I'm mad. I am mad that I didn't come up with this. I am mad that I, I have to. I, not that I, I like this is my man. I, I don't mind giving him credit. He's he, he's he's a, he's a genius. Uh uh, but but. But I, I really wish I would have come up with this. But but it's really the inverse. The 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 uh, acronym is backwards. It's not. It shouldn't be a focus on on American descendants of slaves. It should be a, a soda, solidarity of dispersed Africans. That's oh, what wow. all the greats. That's what all the great ones 
So even as they, you know, unfortunately co-opt a lot of the messaging from Dr. King and others, Dr. King was an internationalist. He was a pan-Africanist. Mm -hmm. He was an anti-capitalist. He was clear on that. And that's why they killed him. I mean, that's, that's, that's almost, I mean, that's for me, at least beyond refute at this point with all the evidence that's out there, all the data. And never mind just what he said, never mind what, what the cause of his assassination, just what he said and what he wrote mm -hmm. that nobody talks about or few people are, are willing to talk about. Uh, um, they, cherry, so, they cherry pick what he wants to say now. They just, the white people just cherry pick all of his quotes now. And it's also, I think, tactically flawed. It's not that I'm saying that we are to, we are to be blind to anti-Black American sentiment that is encouraged in the diaspora. I'm not saying that that doesn't exist, but that is also a creation of imperialism and should be challenged. Uh, sure. But it shouldn't drive the analysis that, that we, we develop in response to it either, because if you're tactically looking to, to benefit Black people here in the United States to cut themselves off from the rest of the African world is tactically flawed. And that's why <laughs> yeah. going back to Du Bois, Robeson, Malcolm, uh, uh, and, and many others, uh, uh, um, uh, Ella Baker and SNCC, all of them were saying we need to take our, our issues to the United Nations and internationalize our struggle. Mm -hmm. That Black people here in the United States deserve to be considered on the world stage as colonized people. That's a beautiful struggle. That's 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 so so ADOS is walking us backwards from that. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> uh, uh, you know, uh, um, it, and then ultimately, I think their politics are, you know, and I've, I've you know, argued this for a long time now, their, their politics are just conservative oh, and they sure. wrap it. They wrap themselves up in this pro black talk uh, and then literally claim themselves to be the replacements of Malcolm X and, and these, oh my you know, gosh. Um, which, you know, I mean. <laughs> So, but anyway, uh, you know, so we just, so I, we definitely disagree. And I am the, the politically, the, the literal reverse, you know, I am soda <laughs> all day, every day. You know? Soda. Um, I learned something new today. I had never heard of that. That is unbelievable. I love the way that message Well, going is. back, I mean, going back, seriously, going back to where we started, uh, if you understand the media environment, it's logical that that our version of a hashtag would not be likely to to uh, reverberate in this media environment in the same way that theirs would. Uh, we're less likely to be picked up as they have by a lot of the mainstream media and outlets because the politics are incompatible. Our politics are incompatible with with conservative state-sponsored capitalist white America, whereas mm -hmm. the the reverse, uh, uh, the backwards hashtag uh, <laughs> um, uh, is, is very compatible. Uh, never mind the links shown to exist literally between founders and very white conservative organizations, but just the politics line up with uh, uh, you know, condemnation of of of, of anti-capitalist politics, condemnation of internationalism, condemnation of of the Black liberation struggle, condemnation of any discussion of political prisoners. As we wrap up Black August, you know, they're not talking about any of that. Uh, mm -hmm. And yet, all of the people that they would reference were talking about these things, and that's why they were targeted for exile, assassination, and imprisonment. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, there is no luminary individual or organization that walked away from the diaspora. Uh, there just isn't any. Um, so, so and, and, you know, whether it's the, the, the Nation of Islam or, or the All African People's Revolutionary Party, all of them have internationalist politics. They're not all necessarily the same anti-capitalist, but, but my point is nobody is producing, nobody out of the Black, certainly radical world is producing an analysis that says, Black America only. Mm -hmm. So the, that, you know, in, in an oversimplification, the only other way to look at it is that the only place for that, those, that, that line of thought to emerge is from the white and conservative world. Wow. I think that's, I think that's a proper conclusion there. I wanted to ask you, um, as far as your book, is that published through a uh, Palgrave Macmillan? the yeah. myth and propaganda, because I'd like to link to people's books 
um, through the publisher, not Amazon, like if I can avoid it. Oh, yeah, no, but better than that. I mean, and, and I would even encourage people just go, I mean, even better, just go to imixwhatilike.org. Awesome. They can, they can okay. easily find the link there. And the digital version is free. I mean, they, the publisher made the digital version free so they can get the book. That's incredible. I appreciate and, that. I'm going to link all your it. information in the episode description. Is there, um, besides I mix what I like.org, is there um, another way that if a viewer or a listener wanted to get in touch with you directly? Um, uh, at I mix what I like for all your social media, I mix what I like at gmail.com. Uh, they can also find my comrades in our broader work at blackpowermedia.org as mm -hmm. well. Um, so yeah, and you know, all of that, I'm, I'm not hard to find and, and I, and I appreciate your, your invitation. I appreciate you, Jared and, and audience, please check out, uh, Black Power Media, just some great stuff going over there. Just, um, any sort of cultural issues, economic, psychological, um, sort of remix morning gonna, show remix morning show is, is oh wow it's, it's wonderful don't listen to your local radio stations this is where you need to be in the mornings um remix morning show um i appreciate you jared again and thanks for accepting the invitation and see you later beautiful people next week we have sabrina salvati a uh, savvy Sass from revolutionary blackout network she's going to join us and we have a bunch of wonderful guests down the road um, salute to everyone. Have a great day. Peace. I appreciate it again. Thank you so much. Anytime. Thanks a lot, my man. I appreciate Thank you. Take thank care. Thank you. I'll keep watching right. you. Okay. Thank bye you. Bye. Likewise. Peace.